Made It in Music podcast. We're here with Dave Barnes, one of my, uh, man, just, you probably don't know, but you've been a hero of mine for a while. Absolutely love um, all of your stuff ever since I heard God gave me you. Yeah, Big thanks. Blake Shelton hit for you. And um, so very a very multifaceted person, as I've been learning in the last few minutes. And I'm ADD. just really, well, <laughs> that's one way to put it. But man, thanks so much for taking the time to be here. Today. Yeah, of course. Appreciate it. So yeah, we'll just, uh, we'll just jump straight in. And, um, you know, the first question we always ask everybody on our uh, episode is what, what was the moment that you made your first dollar in music? Yeah. So, um, uh, I worked for Ed Cash after I moved to Nashville for, uh, so I graduated from MTSU, Middle Tennessee State down in Murfreesboro and moved from there to Nashville. Uh, and a lot of people think like, oh, was it that the siren song, like music was calling you? And that was true. I just started to kind of do some music stuff, but, um, it wasn't like my friends all moved. And so I just kind of came with them though. I knew Nashville would be a good place to be. But um, I worked, um, I was an extra on a movie that shot here called The Last Castle for about three months. And then um, Ed called me about May of that year, my first year living here, 2001. And he said, hey, I'm moving to town. I kind of need, we had known each other a little bit. And he said, I need somebody just to kind of help with stuff. Set up a studio, you know, babysit my kids, sing on BGVs on songs. It was hysterical. (laughs) So I did that for about three or four months, or actually about six months. Um, And then he had recorded a band. Uh, that was about to go on tour, and I just met Matt Wirtz. And so Wirtz and I were kind of conspiring about how we could do shows together. So I think the first dollar I made was that. So my music career literally began basically January 2002. And um, and so they, I think, you know, whatever that was, like opening for them was like the first time I made yeah, you know, and it was like oh, it's a golden <laughs> ticket. You know, that you just listed off like ten things that were like so you were an extra in a movie. Yeah, you got a gig working with Ed Cash, which you know a lot of our listeners probably, you know, they may or may not know him, but he's kind of been like the godfather behind <laughs> a lot of, you know, Christian music and worship yeah. music's yeah. biggest hits. But yeah, I mean, those two things in and of itself are not something you just kind of like stumble into. Yeah, but somehow I did. You know, Ed, Ed, so Ed is basically kind of my big brother. He's one of my closest friends. He's been a mentor and a dear friend of mine for years. Um, And I'd met him through Bebo Norman. Um, And Bebo uh, had just told each of us, you guys need to meet. Like, I'd met Bebo to Young Life Camp. I was actually playing drums for him for his shows during the camp. And uh, and played him. I was just beginning to write songs and very sheepishly played him some stuff. And so, I think personality wise, though more than anything, he was like, I just think you and Ed would yeah. would get on really well. And so, uh, met Ed at one of his shows in Knoxville, and he was like, Man, we should connect. So the next time he came to Nashville, I was still in school at the time. He called me and said, Hey, I'm hanging in Nashville. I think he's recording the Cademans, one of Cademans calls out. So I came up and just hung with him in the studio that whole day, and and we just had a really good time. Like he and I, you know, laugh a lot. And so. So yeah. he just kind of was like, he, he has been a huge influence in my life because he was he was kind of the first guy that was like, hey, I want to help. Just yeah. like whatever I can do to help. And that was, that's a really, I mean, you know, that's such a unique thing. And it's such a powerful thing, I think, especially in an industry that can be very like dog eat dog. Um, not doggy dog. <laughs> that's one of my favorite <laughs> Miss things. Is in somebody's like, God, it's really doggy dog. I'm it's like, a doggy Snoop, dog right? world. It's a doggy dog world. <laughs> uh, no, but it, but he, you know, that that really changed my life in a lot of ways because I think it was such a good example of somebody that really didn't need to didn't need me around didn't and and yet was like, man, I just I really like you and I want to help and so. He hired me on, and at the end of that, we made my first EP, and uh, and sort of stuff. Just I've never, you know, that's all I've done yeah. since. Yeah, um, and so Ed produced that mm-hmm. for you. Yeah, and it was just me and guitar. We did yeah. it in a day. Okay, it was really fast. Gotcha. But um, but he kind of did that as a favor. He was like, yeah. "Look, man, you know, thanks for your help over the last few months, and here's here's um." We worked on it and got, and that was really, you know, I toured on that man for I think like two years. Wow, five songs, crazy. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> that was kind of the beginning. Yeah. So when did music enable you to go full time? 
oddly enough, then, I mean, you know, I had negative overhead. I mean, I think I, you know, my rent at the time was a couple hundred bucks. I was yeah. living with a couple of, a couple other guys and by the grace of God, man, I graduated school with no debt, which was huge. Yeah. Um, I can't say how much that was a gift. Um, mm. and so, it, you know, it, it allowed me a lot of space. Like, you know, when you've got $400, you got to right. make a month all of a sudden, like, you know, yeah. it's, I'll never forget that first. Now this was a different time because you know, you were selling CDs and shirts on the road. Yeah. And you could really make money. And yeah. I'll never forget coming home from those three weeks. So I'd open for the guy who's now my manager, his band, uh, Wurtz and I did. And then Wurtz and I did two weeks, just the two of us. And I will never forget coming home. So after Wurtz is your manager. Weeks. No, 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 no. God, that would be a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> Wurtz, say, Wurtz, yeah. So the guy whose band, <laughs> he he's now my manager, his band, Wurtz and I both opened for the, him. Okay. Okay. And then we broke off into two weeks. So I came back after three weeks of being gone and I'll never forget laying the cash out and it was like I don't know, two thousand dollars. It wasn't like it was like you know, you like take grand pictures with it. Yeah, like, yeah, like <laughs> you like trying to dive into it like Scrooge, um, which would have killed him by the well, way. Nobody Scrooge talks about reference. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah would have. But um, but but I just remember thinking like this is so much money, even though yeah. you know it was good, but but it was just like. Oh my God, this, this could work yeah. and because, but again, I just had no overhead. I was, I was living on ramen noodles and like cardboard. So, and probably loving it, right? And loving it. It was yeah. the best, you know? Uh, so thankfully it, it didn't take a lot and I was able to do it in a way that, you know, again, I didn't have a, I didn't have a wife, I didn't have kids. I didn't have yeah. like anything I was having. To and pay, I guess at know? the time Instagram didn't exist, right? No, so, no, no. so you're not. You know, comparing your living situation. No, with no, no. Ty Lopez, which you know, <laughs> which I do daily now, hourly. I may even check while we're sitting here. Uh, but I think you know that's a good point. I think something that can't be understated. I mean, that's a great point, Seth. I think like, you know, those days. I, I benefited, and I think a lot of us did, from this inability to compare ourselves because, yeah. you know, Mayer was coming up then, Mraz was coming up then, Howie Day was kind of coming up, and I wasn't on the wave they were. Like, I kind of caught the next wave in, Words sure. and I. But I didn't, I mean, the, in dark moments, I'd go like, God, I wish I could play guitar like John, or God, Jason's got this cool voice. But but there was just, there's too many, um, there's too many differences like I wasn't born where they were I didn't have the parents they had I didn't have the experience so as an artist I wasn't sitting around going like I wish I could be them I w- that was inspiration it was like man I love these songs yeah. and I love what John's doing how can that affect what I'm doing where these days there's so many more points for comparison and yeah. I think it's really dangerous I, and I think as much just musically like forget what it's doing to your head and how you feel about the car they just bought or the tour they're playing because they're taking you know selfies right, in right. front of the audience which is fine, but it's like, even just musically going like, well, if that music is affording them this life, well, then maybe that's the music I should be doing too, as opposed to just kind of being off in your own thing. Like I feel like a lot of us were 15 years ago, just like popping up going, Hey, it's what I got, (laughs) you know, uh, which was really nice and really was sort of a blessing. Yeah, man, dive into that. Cause Mm -hmm. man, you you just hit on this whole thing that we all struggle with as as creatives is this comparison trap. Um, how do you deal with that? I mean, because obviously social media is probably, I imagine, mm-hmm. a part of what you do mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And do you just not look at it and care? Like, how, what, what are some strategies? You know, you truthfully, I have to be really careful about who I follow. I think I know myself enough to know, like, some people I can follow and it's just not going to do me any good. Not because I don't love them and not because some of them are friends of mine. Yeah. But just because I know that if I see that picture, I'm going to go like, Oh, they didn't want to write me, huh? Uh, <laughs> you yeah, know, and I start yeah. spiraling and I yeah. may cry now. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it helps me. I just think knowing myself and knowing like what's good for me to see, what's good for me not to see, what's, you know, how can I celebrate my friends in spite of sometimes really struggling with my inadequacies compared to what feels like their adequacies. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think... Uh, I think that's a lot of what this record is about, oddly enough. So so the record just came out. It's called Who Knew It Would Be So Hard to Be Myself. And that's literally what it's about. I mean, there's songs that are... When I started doing this co-writing thing, especially, which, you know, you've you've done so well with, um, it it really rocked me because I went from a career as an artist that was successful in its version of success, uh, which obviously was not, like, huge. It wasn't small. It was just right for me. Sure, sure. 
and has been just right to to w- w- there was no fixed success. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like as an artist for me, I just thought like I was so blessed because everything just felt like, oh, that's awesome. And yeah. I didn't have these aspirations where I was like, if I don't play this room by this time or sell this many records or have a single, I was just kind of always glad to be there. Uh, writing is different because as you know so well, there's a fixed win. Right. You want to get right. that cut and then the single. Right. And I just didn't know how to do it. I, I, I walked into that space and I just felt like I'm terrible at this. Like, uh, you know, other people are getting what I'm, I'm trying to achieve and the writing with the artists I want to write with. And, uh, and it really messed me up. And yeah. it's in oddly enough in my mid thirties too, like, hmm. which was really bizarre because I had this wisdom I'd gained over 35 years of living and knowledge yet it wasn't plug and play. Like sure. I was like, I still feel terrible and feel like I suck and like yeah, yeah. nothing's working. And so that record is the most, this record is the most vulnerable I've ever been because I was like, you know, I just, I got to talk about this. Like, you know, there's a song called Chasing Dreams and that's what it's about. It's just like, what, what do you do when stuff's not working like you want it to? Um, and so it was weird to be that old and to struggle with that because I would have thought, oh, like that was my 20s. Sure. It's like you figure it out. And then when you add this other career to what you're doing and it, takes the same time it would have in your 20s but it's just in your 30s it's sure. tricky because you kind of like haven't I learned these lessons I mean I've had success as a writer why is it not working here and then realizing like because it just doesn't yeah. you know it's a new thing yeah. you're you're 18 again you know well I want to hear more about that and I'm excited about your new record um, it's interesting because on this show we talk to artists we talk to people who are in the industry we talk to managers we talk to songwriters you kind of have blurred the lines a little bit of of really a lot of things, and yeah. especially what you're doing with your new tour, which is, you know, artist, but you're also a songwriter, but it's also stand up comedy, yeah. which I think is brilliant. And I want to talk about that, but um, can you talk about the moment that you crossed over the line from just being an artist to, uh, okay, this is something I can do to help other artists' careers. Yeah, that that is a huge deal. Again, man, I think that's Ed. I think Ed um, and and Chris Rice, uh, both of those guys were so benevolent in their attention and care for me. Um, And I just had so many people that when I would meet them and give them records, Amy Grant, Bonnie Raitt, these artists that would just kind of go like, I just want to help you. And I remember thinking like, this is transformative. I mean, like they can literally open doors for you Mm. that you you couldn't get in. And all of a sudden people are like, yeah, cool, come hang out in here now. And you're like, like for real, <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah. I've been out there for a good yeah. few years and I'm just suddenly in here. So for me, there, there's, I, I think that's one of my biggest passions is helping uh, people do the same thing. Cause it just, it was so huge for me. I mean, yeah, like yeah. it was, it was a huge part of my story and still is, you know? And yeah. so for me, it's, I, I, I get so much joy from being able to do the same thing for other people. Um, because, you know, and it's just so fulfilling. You yeah, just get yeah. such a great sense of uh, yeah. joy from that, you know? Well, for you as a songwriter, too, I mean, can you just, I know you've probably shared this story a bunch, but just for people who haven't heard it, what what was the moment that you kind of uh, found out that Blake Shelton wanted to cut one of your songs? Yeah. So, so long story short, a girl that worked at his label at Warner uh, <clears throat> over dinner one night, she's married now, but she wasn't at time she was eating with my wife and I and said, Hey, I got a random story. Blake heard God gave me you. And I literally was like, Blake who? Cause there was no context right, for yeah. like, why would Blake Shelton hear it? Yeah. And he wasn't Blake Shelton. Like he is now sure. like all caps. He was yeah, like yeah. big B, big yeah, S. Yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, where now it's all caps and like bold <laughs> underlined italics, uh, maybe lightning and some emojis. Um, mm, but, uh, <laughs> but he, so, so she was like, he's heard the song. He really likes it. I think they may play it in their wedding. That was like round one. Wow. I was like, God, what an honor, you know? Yeah. And there was some, maybe they'll get me there to do it, whatever. So fast forward, like a month, literally it was like another month. She's like, okay, well it looks like he's going to record it. Wow. And I was like, well, that's even better. And then like fast forward another two months, I show up at home and, and she and my wife had thrown like a little surprise party for me that the single was going to be the single. Wow. Um, but, but he had heard, it was really interesting. The, 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 the really long version shortened is, I was in a season of my career where I was just really f- frustrated and struggling with feeling like um, it just wasn't working. You know, I was yeah. like, why? Like, and really struggling with lore with that. Like, what's the deal with 
stuff's just not working like I wanted to. So I just prayed. I literally just started praying for encouragement. I felt like that was the word the Lord gave me. And so I was like, all right, mm-hmm. Lord, I just want to be encouraged. And it wasn't this, like, I wasn't praying through script. It wasn't like yeah. this, you know, right. Jabez prayer. Kind. I right. literally was just like, Lord, I just need encouragement. And so I wrote that song. It was the last song that was going to be on this record. Uh, it wasn't even like we hadn't even, we had cut the record and it was done. In fact, it's about to be mixed, and I called Ed, and I said, wow. hey, I got this new song, and I sent it to him. He's like, the band's going to be here tomorrow, be here at 9. Like, wow. it was no conversation. I was like, oh, so you like it, you know? Wow. So we go and we cut it. Um, we do kind of like a band version of it. Ed calls me. I'm on the road a bunch in this season of life, and he's like, hey, man, I've kind of tweaked it because I think this could be a big song. Hmm. And so he added, like, the drums. Like, we yeah. had the lick because that's kind of what I wrote the song to, but sure. he had popped it out, yeah. and I remember hating it. I was like, <laughs> no, you ruined it. My integrity is gone. <laughs> and he's like, dude, listen, you know that I love you. I promise you, I think if you'll get out of the way of this thing, this could be a big song. Yeah. Then he, so, he literally said that? Literally. He, and I was wow. like, all right. I mean, it was a struggle too, man, because I, I really, like, integrity is a big deal to me. And I just didn't want any of my friends or whatever to feel like, oh, you're selling out. the drum loop at the top. <laughs> Go giggle. And I'm like, ah, you know. Um, so anyway, long story short, we, we so uh, Buddy comes in and says, hey, I think this could be a radio hit at Christian. Yeah. And I'd never done Christian. Hmm. And I wasn't against that, but I was just really careful. I was like, I didn't want to do that. That was not... I, I, again, a lot yeah. of my career is blurred lines. It was like a foot in the Christian world, a foot in the mainstream world. Sure. And I was really scared that it would turn into like a, this thing would whirlpool on me and all of a sudden I was Kinda just in the Christian in. world. Yeah. 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 And not in a bad way, but that's just not my calling. Yeah. Um, and, and I've just had so much, I've felt like there's been such a cool <clears throat> thing to do in the mainstream world with me for years. Yeah. So God is on me though yeah. immediately. Because yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. my manager's like, man, I don't think so. And I just felt like the Lord was like, dude, you can't do this. Like, you can't pray for encouragement right. and then close doors. That's not how this works. Yeah. So I was like, all right, let's do it. So all of a sudden, like, it just it does really well at Christian Radio. I had such a blast doing Christian Radio promo. I yeah. loved meeting the Christian Christian Radio world. Had yeah. so much fun. Like, legitimate it was one of the funnest seasons of my career. Doing radio shows, you sure. know, it suited my personality really well. And met some dear friends. I mean, I yeah. loved to those people and still do and so it did really well at Christian Radio went to the Christian Radio Ask Cap Awards it was awesome yeah, and I remember yeah. thinking like Lord you answered the prayer Yeah, like there was my encouragement I was, and I got like weepy at the wow. broadcaster convention because I was like guys thank you for being a part of this answered wow. prayer like wow. this has really changed my life you know and then that was just that, well, that was the humor is that that was just sort of like the beginning of so then when, when she called and told me about Blake um, he had heard it I guess driving home from a uh, uh, from the airport, and he had just he and Miranda were just beginning to date, and he just loved it. He heard it on Christian Radio. Yeah. I mean, how funny is that, right? Lord's like, <laughs> I told you, you know. I don't know if he talks like that, like a radio announcer. I think he does. I actually hear him exactly <laughs> he like that. And like I the will price is right every time I pray. Dave, you should trust me. <laughs> um, guy so white, uh, but uh, but so it ended up this beautiful answer to a prayer of just encouragement, you know. Yeah, that's incredible. Well. Let's jump into our full circle five, and then I want to hear about your new record and the yeah. songs and yeah. the process. Yeah. Um, what one book or record do you most commonly recommend people? You know, that, so there's two. Um, book, I, I think, book that really changed my life was Life Together by Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a mm. huge book for me. That was like probably the most seminal life-changing book for me. And that, I read that in my 20s and early in my 20s, but it was like a game changer for me. So I, I always love that book and recommend that book. Um, albums, there's two. One of them is uh, Mark Cohn, who wrote Walking to Memphis. He has an album called The Rainy Season. Yeah. That was, again, a really seminal record for me um, in that it's just really emotive and it's it's beautiful and awesome. The other is um, Tommy Sims. Um, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, I'm blanking, but it's... Yeah. Um, Oh, that's embarrassing. He's only got one. <laughs> so if His you Google it, you'll find it. <laughs> Tommy but Tommy Sims wrote, record. you know, Change the Change World, world yeah. and all these amazing, and he's a phenomenal bass player and yeah. multi-instrumentalist, but he made one record for Univer- for Peace and Love. Yeah. Tommy Sims, Peace and Love. But he made one record for Universal, spent like five bajillion dollars on it, which tanked the whole thing, of course. Sure. But it came out in the early 2000s, and it's just, to me, one of the most like gorgeous. It's the culmination of so much what I love about music. It's got cool rock and roll stuff. It's got really vulnerable stuff. It grooves. Yeah. 
it's he and Needham on most of it, and it just feels like yeah. it'll just break your neck, you know. I love it, man. Check it out. Uh, second question: Failure only turns into a lesson if it changes the way that you uh, view or changes your perspective. Right. Do you have a favorite failure that you can remember in life and maybe something that, you know, changed the way that you do things now? Yeah. Um, I think this, you know, recently it's been, I really caught, so I was going to stop doing the co-writing thing. Like I really felt like this is a year ago, like a year and a half oh, wow. ago. And, uh, I was just like, you know, I don't know if I can handle this failure. Like I was so hard on myself and I was watching my friends getting these cuts and having singles and success. And I was like huffing and puffing, you know, I was like doing, and I was like, all right, I think I'm done. I can't. And and I was just like, so miserable. And my wife even was like, I'm worrying about you. Like you Mm -hmm. were really being hard on yourself. So I was uh, January of last year. I was like, I think I'm done. And, uh, and my publisher called and he was like, look, man, we can let you out of this if you want to. I really would love for you to do another year here. Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like good things are on the horizon. And I was like, man, let me think about it. And, um, and I kind of died a bunch of deaths in that month. I sort of let all those things like, okay, what if I never have a country single? What if I ne- never get another country cut? What does that mean about me? What's that mean about the Lord and I? What's that mean about all these things? And I think I finally was like, you know, it's okay. Like yeah. I tried hard. And then oddly enough, because God is this way in my life sometimes, I got a call from Thomas Strat a couple months later. And he was like, hey, man, congrats. <laughs> and I was like, for what? And he's like, you got the first single off my new record. And I was like, could you give me a second? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh my God thank you, Lord. Thank you. Well, that's great. That's good news, man. I'm glad you So, you know, and, and it was a hit, which is great. But, you know, that 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 failure really changed how I viewed that. It, yeah. cha- it took – I just don't put the pressure on myself anymore, and I think I'm more okay with being myself to the point of the record title. Like, just going, you know, I do what I do, and that's going to be valuable in some rooms and maybe yeah. not valuable in other rooms. But And when I, you say failure, did you mean, like, mm-hmm. you were just writing, a, doing tons and tons of co-writes, and they just weren't getting cut? Just or weren't what, getting what you... cut, weren't no singles. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, and I think this is a tricky part of that season, is a lot of my contemporaries are my age. So they're in there. I mean, they are caning it. You know, yeah. they're 30, mid-30s, late 30s. They put in their time. Yeah. But all that time, I was doing my artist thing. So I'm, I'm kind of like a freshman to their, like, doctorate. You sure. know what I mean? But they're my buds and they're my age. Yeah. And they came to Nashville and I came to Nashville. And I'm going like, well, these guys and girls are, like, getting cuts. All, well, I'm, and it's like, well, because they've been here for a long time. And people yeah. know who they are and they know what they and they've And they've been... Hammering at that particular lane for for since they 10, moved 15 here. years, and this and is and this is a new. If I'm hearing you right, oh yeah, it's brand new, newer, newer, it's newer three, season. I'm just three years into it. Yeah, and I had a lot of people tell me that, but I just couldn't hear it. I was just yeah. way too insecure to be like, okay, let me give it time. I was like, no, I stink. Right, there's no answer, but then I'm failing. <laughs> people are like, dude, failure's a big word, man. You should be careful. I was like, no, but that's what it is. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, man. Before you, uh, if you can kind of rewind all the way back to the pre. Um, you know, Ed Cash, Beaver yeah. Homer, and all those days. Yeah. If you could identify one thing that held you back from jumping in full time to a career in music, yeah. what would that have been? You know, I think for me it was just experience. Like, I literally, dude, when I got Tim Tissue as a drummer, I majored in drumming and percussion, mm. and I didn't play guitar. Wow. So by sophomore year, I was playing guitar, I was writing songs. Drumming was not what it was when I got there. I was suddenly less interested in it. So for me, I literally started singing basically on stage. Mm. I mean, like my sophomore year. And I mean, you can imagine how terrifying that was. So so a lot of it for me was, but I was that dumb, blind ambition where I, and maybe blind ambition. But, um, <laughs> Did you say blind or blonde? <laughs> maybe both. Um, but I just thought, you know, to do this, you just got to do it. Um, but I think in those moments where I was like, eh, you know, and especially moving to Nashville and you know this, like I start meeting people who've been singing since they were like neonatal Mm. and I'm like, that guy sings, I do whatever this is, but that like I'm crying and he's halfway through the first (laughs) verse, you know? So I think a lot of it was just kind of like experience, you know, it's just kind of going like, I don't, I've never done this. I don't know what to do, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's good. And I I think a lot of people probably feel (laughs) the same way when they're getting started. Um, And man, and I even loved how you touched on that, just that it's, it takes so much longer than most people realize. Like your friends who have been in here since their twenties and they're in their mid thirties and put in their time. Yeah. I mean, 
how long do you think it typically takes? So, you know, each, each of it to me is different. Like I, I think there's different timelines. One, according, you know, there, there's just then, I mean, you know, this, there's those lightning strike friends. You see them move to town and all of a sudden they have 50 number ones in the first week. And you're like, yeah. what the heck, you know? And, and, and so, so there's always the anomaly. There's always the outlier, but I, I do think I, this is something I'm learning. I think you have to respect, I'm a big respect guy. It's the first challenge of me, but, um, you, you have to respect the fact that other people have put in their time. So it's not fair. I think when you show up somewhere going like, Hey, everybody check me out. When you have the class that's been there, that's the senior class, if you will, to your freshman class. Yeah. And they're going, well, hold on, man. Like, we can't make room for you because we've been waiting for our shot too. And this is our moment. Like mm-hmm. respect that because yeah. I think sometimes it's kind of like, well, I want to be up there. And it's like, well, dude, have you put in 10 years of doing this? Yeah. Well, no. Well then maybe do that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and not to be disrespectful, that, but I just think like for me, you know, so for writing, I do think it's a five year town in the country world. I think, um, and again, you'll have guys and girls who, who don't, who get here and it's successful. I think for most of, us, you know, you put in your time, people get to know you. They, and again, man, it's already so populated with hit writers. Sometimes right. it's not, there's not room, but it's just kind of like, Hey, if we're putting together a writing camp. We kind of already know who's going to be there. Sure. And, and we'll try to get you in next time. Or if we have somebody fall out, maybe it'll, you can, so, you know, being careful not to sort of over yeah. dramatize that with me going, Oh, it must mean that I stink, but just going, no, man, it just means a lot of people are good too. Sure. And it's not, has nothing to do with your inability. It just has to do with the fact there's a lot of people that are able. They're just really um, good. Yeah. And then the artist thing is tricky these days, man. You, you probably know more about that than I do. Um, working with as many artists as you do, but you know, I, th- I think music has changed so much. I don't know. I don't even know what makes somebody successful these days, mm-hmm. even monetarily, like what it means to sort of be able to afford rent and, and, because you know it's just changed. Money's yeah. different now. Well, you and and you segued perfectly into the next question. But like, there's obviously things that are working for you right now. But mm-hmm. what what is what is something that's working for you right now? You know, and here's the irony. I mean, is you couldn't have asked a more like set up the new record question. But <laughs> I think just learning to be myself, like, yeah. and, and not you know, and I want to I want to make this really clear. Not just who I am, but who the Lord made me to be. Because yeah. I think we can try to find ourselves outside of our relationship with the Lord and that gets really dangerous. But I think for me going, you know, Lord, you sort of made me this weird, quirky, um, artist dude. And, um, the more I lean into that, the better, like with stand up and yeah. not trying to not, you know, for a long time I didn't do that on purpose. Like I was like, I don't want to sort of like awaken the Kraken too early because like what if humor overtakes my music career Mm. because music will always be my first love sure it's the most challenging I think rewarding thing that I do Mm. uh, career wise and so music was more challenging than stand up oh yeah much more much more yeah just because that's how I'm built humor to me is it's hard it's really hard but it's it's much more natural it's much more like being an idiot to me is pretty easy. <laughs> so, you know, rank, 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 that, that stuff is just in there. Uh, not to say that I'm the funniest guy ever, but, but for whatever reason, you know, that's always been a little more natural. Or music was always like, ooh, yeah, you yeah. know. And every day I write, it's another like, all right, we got to push this boulder up the hill. Yeah. But in a good way, you know, where humor to me is a little more like natural and I don't have to think about it quite yeah. as much, you know. And I feel like I could probably answer this myself just by everything you just told me. But if you woke up tomorrow and everything had changed, your your music business had disappeared, the, the, the cuts were drying up, the singles were dried up, and the opportunities just weren't there. And you had to start from square one. But you still got you, – you get to keep all the experience. You yeah. get to keep all the knowledge yeah. and the wisdom yeah. and relationships. Where would you start? You know, there's there's a few things that, that I think I would love to do. Um, I don't know that I would ever want to be a professional comedian. It's just too gnarly. That that mm-hmm. lifestyle is, I think, really hard. Um, and I don't know that I'm cut out for it. Uh, I think advertising is really fun. You know, coming up with, like, commercials for things and going, huh. like, how do we make selling super glue funny? <laughs> you know, that's interesting <laughs> to me. Um, I also really love – I love people. I love – mentor discipleship stuff. I wonder if I would be at a church somewhere as like a community pastor community or something like that. Um, or counseling, I think maybe, um, 
some of that um, would be really fun. And I think this, honestly, I think the podcast interview world yeah. um, is really cool. Yeah. Um, so I think all those, and especially the future, which you guys are so wise to be investing in of podcasting, I think it's really bright. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like the, the Wild West out there in a really fun way. Um, yeah. So yeah. that would be a fun, you know, sort of like see what happens or something like that. It's awesome. So talk about your new record a little bit. What, yeah. are, what are you working on right now? Obviously, it just came out a little bit ago. Yeah. But uh, new tour. Mm -hmm. all, what, what, are, what all are you working on that you want it's to a really fun, it, It's a really fun um, season because, <clears throat> you know, again, um, we this is just kids. I have yeah. three kids and I'm always sick. Like, Daddy, give me a kiss before you get I'm like, oh, just like, constant can you just, stuff. It's just like, yeah. you don't even hear, uh, you know, this is not sinus. This is just children. It's just normal. <laughs> this is just life as a dad <laughs> manifested in me sounding like this is what this yeah. is. Yeah. But, um no, it's a really fun season because a new record, I really think is maybe the best record I've ever done from beginning to end. You know, like I so Ed and I started. Ed had to kind of bow out because of some family stuff early on. So I ended up producing the record pretty much hmm. on my own, which was a real yeah. challenge. But as you know really well, it was also really fun because yeah. I have a studio in my backyard and I could sort of dip out for two hours and really get this yeah. guitar stuff right. And then where well, I'd never been able to do that before. So I think it's the most paid attention to record I've ever done. Like mm. I've really cared about this one. Yeah. Um, and I'm super proud of it. I think the songs are great. Like I don't have any of those, like just, just skip track six. Hey, go track seven. <laughs> Woo. You know, like I'm really proud of it because I just spent a lot of time on yeah. it. So that's fun. Um, and I think too, you know, like I, I, I'm terrified of not being relevant as an artist. Mm. Like that's the thing. I'm, and so for me, I was like, I just want to keep making music that feels inspired. That feels like, it matters because I just don't want to be the guy in his, you know, I'm 39 and be 40 this summer. I just don't want to be the guy that's like in my forties writing lullabies all the time. Yeah. And like house at Pooh corner over and over, which is great. <laughs> but the people go like, Oh, we've lost him to being a father. Or, we've lost him to irrelevance or he's super comfortable and isn't writing music that matters anymore. Mm. Um, so I think that's fun. I think the other part too is like, you know, we are leaning a lot more into the comedy part of my sort of brand, if you will. And so the tour, like we talked about a little bit, is going to be um, music and then break, stand up, break, and then some more music. And, and you know, so it's, it's a really fun season. It feels like, you know, I'm entering, I'm sort of beginning a new chapter of my career, which I really like, because we're, we're really sort of opening it up to a lot more possibilities and how it looks and, and um, leaning a little more into who I am and less of what I do, mm. uh, which I think is, is um, kind of terrifying, but I think is eventually hopefully going to be more effective and productive because, you know, hopefully I can always be who I am to yeah. some version so that if people are like, well, you know what? We'd like to have you come in and do some stand up, And it's like, great, I'll go do that. And then mm. we want to have you in the band come in and do some shows. Like, cool. Let's see what, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's really fun. It feels, you know, it feels like the little, ooh, yeah, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> what happens next? You know? So people can hear about tour dates and everything on your website, I'm mm -hmm. assuming. Mm -hmm. where, where do people find out about you? So DaveBarnes.com and then all the social media stuff is Dave Barnes Music. All right. Yeah. Well, Dave, this has been an absolute blast. Yes. Thanks, thanks so, so much. much. Yeah. I'm Seth Mosley. This has been the Made It in Music podcast. We're here at the Full Circle Music Studios. We've been here with Dave Barnes. Again, go to DaveBarnes.com and check out his tour dates and his new record.